Hello and a warm collision is YYC. Welcome to guest morning, Mr. Doug Hayden. How are you doing, Doug? Mm. I am doing great. Thank you very much, Tyler. Uh, oh, so good to so good to have you on. I think we've I, I met you, then we ran into each other at another thing, and then we were on a call, and it was Calgary conspires or Western Canada conspires. <laughs> yeah, once once you meet somebody and you go, you figure it out in Calgary, and it's like, how come we haven't met before? One hundred percent. Oh, you you know yeah. you know and you know. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, this podcast is yeah. the, epit- the the epitome of the one <laughs> one point one degree of separation that that is Calgary. But hey, let's jump right into it. Uh, you're the president, CSO, and founder at Arthroto. Uh, Arthur Show right. Industries yeah. Inc. If I'm going to be officially creeping on your LinkedIn, which I am, so what? <laughs> let, let's let, let's jump in the elevator. I think an elevator is an appropriate ride for your business as well. What are you guys all about? What do you do? Let's do a little bit of the elevator pitch, and we'll open it up from there. So I'll do the elevator pitch, and then if you want, do some background as to, to how course. this all kind of came together. Um, but long long story short, um, the COVID caused a, a dramatic shift in how people either work. Right. Um, and especially for white collar workers that were in office. Yeah. And it was really clear that folks weren't going to go back to the office anymore. And uh, that, you know, the, the primary um, kind of next secondary use for an unused office building, uh, everybody thinks is going to be residential, which and the, municip- the municipalities that are being affected by, you know, empty downtown cores of, you know, office folks not returning to office they're the ones that that have seen this but you know if i if i'm really condensing this i have a background in prefabricated offices so commercial where we'd build out an entire office uh, on an empty floor plate and everything would be prefabricated and by the way calgary is is very much a center for this oh, okay um, yeah and it and for a, a couple of reasons which I'll, I'll dive into as well but there was nobody that was tackling converting empty office to residential with a prefabricated solution. Mm -hmm. Nobody. And uh, we saw the opportunity. There's a number of companies in Calgary that have a lot of different specialities that that are very much focused on this. And Calgary was a leader in converting empty office uh, to residential. Yeah, uh, we couldn't make a business out of it though. One city isn't really a business for getting <laughs> no, into no. prefabricated as much as you'd like to. Um, but obviously, coming out of COVID, uh, what happened to Calgary eight or nine years ago was now happening all over North America mm. to every major city, except for a few that that really weren't ever office focused, right? So, like a Vancouver or Miami, they're not as affected, but almost every other city is. So we just said, well, nobody's doing it this way. There's enough expertise and enough, you know, knowledge in Calgary that can handle doing prefabricated solutions for converting uh, unused office to residential, and that's what we did. We formed this company around that, that you know, thesis, and we're hitting the market. We're we're literally legally only about six months old, not even. Oh, okay, so you're, you're still you're still yeah. measuring in weeks and months oh, if it was if it was a newborn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I gotcha. I gotcha. yeah, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so strangely enough, we had a leg up because of our hollowing out of downtown based on kind of 13, 14, 15 energy sector changes, Yeah, which gave correct. which gave yeah. us a head start on a weird thing to have it want to have a head start. Or, or, I, yeah, I appreciate very... finding the benefit of the head start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so is this also a symptom? I've had other people on like, oh my God, you look at other sectors when it comes to manufacturing, when it comes to uh, so many things and oh, construction, we still show up on site and cut two by fours. (laughs) Is this also an opportunity that this industry, maybe the technology or the need finally aligned with the change that maybe has been slow to come? And I don't want to point fingers, but you're not the first one is like, hey, we weren't very revolutionary in a lot of sense when it comes to construction, especially residential more so. The conversations I think I've just had have been more with those individuals. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you, the way you build a house really hasn't changed a whole lot in the last hundred years. Right. It's and part of that is that it's you know, it's not like people haven't tried. Trust me, there have been massive efforts to do, you know, factory built housing. Mm-hmm. Right. Massive efforts. Um, you know, the, there's there's a lot of, you know, you know, sort of dead bodies along the way here, right? Um, <laughs> it's so, not for you know, lack you of trial and error. I appreciate well, that. yeah, you yeah. don't necessarily want to be the tip of the spear, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but most of, most of the drop has occurred because either it, the process becomes too expensive at, at a certain point to do, okay. right? Meaning that, you know, there's, there's no cost benefit at the end of the day, right? Um, so that was, that was one, uh, you know, outlier. And the other is that you've got a whole system 
designed for building a hundred years ago. So you have very outdated codes that haven't kept up with technology, mm-hmm. that not even electrical, not even basic electrical, right? I mean, just going from even piping from copper to a, a you know, a plastic, which is far easier to work with, right? And far more resilient. Even that took, you know, a decade. So you've got a, you've got that whole, we'll call it the building bureaucracy that you have to deal with, yeah, the building yeah. code. But I mean, there's reasons for it, right? You want to make sure what you're doing is safe, but you also come on, right? Like, I mean, e- even in jurisdictions like Chicago, I mean, you can't run whips like an electrical whip in a wall longer than five feet. And that's been brought about not because of code, but electricians were worried they're going to lose their jobs, right? Now try to find an electrician. Yeah, now yeah. they want that, you know, so that they can do work faster. So, yeah, there's a number of factors. It's all coming to bear at the same time. And there's been a couple of false starts in what we'll call factory built housing as well. Um, just in terms of, and, and by the way, the situation we're in in housing right now is it hasn't been this bad since right after World War II. Okay. In terms of, like in terms that, of, in terms of just access, shortage, want, shortage of actual yeah, residential. If you want to yeah. put a real pin in it. Like when, or was housing ever this in this much of a crisis? Yeah. One time that you can point to, uh, within recent memory is after world war two. Hmm. That's where we're at. I was reading to some the other day randomly, just some of the tactics that the government put in place to from no interest or no money down or things to try to get yeah. these GIs all access to housing at that, at that time. And how, what, what a crisis yeah. level that it was actually at. <laughs> yeah. And they brought in one thing which is interesting because we were actually using that quote like not since world war ii has housing been this bad it's yeah. in our videos and everything um but it it's funny because the government of canada just brought in a plan that that was uh enabled right after that and it was basically to have a set of drawings that anybody could use and you know basically that was that it already met code all you had to do was just uh, you know the city can just approve it and off you'd go to the races I don't think that's really what we're looking for these days mm. um, because, you know, you didn't have AutoCAD back then. You didn't have all these tools. No. I, get, I, think, <laughs> I think the government's just throwing darts right now, right? Because when the, one thing they won't do is it, it's going to need money. You're going to need money behind it. Like mm. there, there's just no two ways about it. So how, what that looks like, I don't know. Yeah, that, that right? feels but like it's a different podcast even from what we're talking it, it, about right Totally. Now. But, and, and I'll talk a bit about how some of what we're doing is getting funded as well. Yeah, well, Calgary let, is so successful. Okay, right? well, the, at, at the root of it, this is very Calgary and Western Canadian centric. But most, like most yep. problems you run into, they're much bigger than our borders or much bigger than our geography. Talk to me yep. a little bit about just the difference between like a you know this type of a modernization or let's just throw digital transformation. It's a good buzzy buzzword uh, yep. around when it comes to residential versus this. Um, Office conversion. Is it because of the volume, because of the one single location that you're able to do things more at scale? Like, Just talk to me about why this is such a better or an opportunity that seems to be making sense. Obviously, you built your business on it versus the, the, the bodies at the side of the road for the residential construction side. But so the, the, the reason this is an inflection point. So I, I'm going to give you a bit of my background now. My background before this was, like I said, I'd worked for a company called Smed. If anybody in Calgary would know who that is. Pretty around, well known. Pretty know. well known. Yeah. American. So, and, and it actually, I, I would credit uh, a lot of what is done with office, like prefabricated office, uh, to Mogan's. Like he really, he really he has pushed the curve, right? Um, you know, it, it, when you're pushing the curve, though, you're going to break some dishes, right? Like it's going <laughs> to, yes. you know. So yeah. Anyway, um, I had him on the show but, a few years ago when he when he started spun up Fox Built, and yeah. uh, yes, yeah, yes, he's uh, guy. he's like, a prolific individual with it, and, 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 and still, yeah, he is. He's a character, and he doesn't give up. He's like. You know, he's, he's a bit of an inspiration in that sense, because yes. I think, I, I think we're only about 10 years apart. Um, but prior to that, I was actually in, I, I was involved in technology. I used to run data centers. Oh, so, okay. and then uh, that actually wound up um, because I actually, I got a strange background. Uh, I studied film and television and then there was no work. So I wound up working in a data center part-time, graduated, that turned into full-time, had an aptitude for it. Uh, after about 10 years, I started uh, working with smaller companies and I would get them into a position where they would work with bigger companies. Um, and I actually happened to specialize in what I will just call multimedia at the time. Okay. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I would do is I, w- I was working with Cisco Systems and Lucent and all these big players. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and having done that and getting a couple small software companies into these bigger companies, uh, an opportunity came up in Calgary to go work with Evans Consoles. And so I came out. I was brought up by Evans Consoles. They're the ones that put the console systems in to NASA. That's control, what they would they, do. Yeah, they, they, they do control rooms, right? Correct. So yeah, if you ever okay. saw NASA's control rooms, Evans does all that work. Okay. So, um, and I, I spent about a year there and uh, the program I was in, it, it just, it wasn't meshing, right? I just, it, it, it was to do public space uh, work and I just, I, I wasn't comfortable there. I wanted to do something a little more. Um, somebody said, go talk to uh, Smed, to Mogens, and I called him and he brought me into a, a business development group that handled raised floor and specialized in focusing on the tech players like okay. the Cisco's and those guys. So that's what I was doing. Dot com was in its full bloom. So, I mean, you couldn't keep up with the book of business, right? It just was exponential. Then dot com. And, and then we all, we all know what happened. Burst. We all know what happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then Doug's on the streets, right? So, <laughs> and then Doug decides to go work with his wife in residential real estate, right? Even though he's got commercial, because I had, I got a commercial license to do that because I was working with a lot of um, commercial realtors at the time. So I got all the designations, CCIM and all that. Um, but anyway, I learned how to, to cost these projects out. So a lot of it was based on what's called TI dollars, tenant improvement dollars. Mm -hmm. So you would throw that into the mix and you could justify using our solution, which was built off site versus doing construction on site, which is a big mess and took forever. But from a channel right? strategy, from a sales perspective, that makes a lot of sense because something's going to happen. How do we mitigate it? And then how do we leave the building owner with better, better than they found it almost and from here's a build-up perspective? Really, here's what's really interesting. I just yeah, got yeah. off a call with an architect out of, uh, out of Washington. Uh, Washington, D.C. And so what we used as the calling card to get us into projects was raised floor. So we had a raised floor solution that instead of having, if you look at those pictures from the, the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, you'd see all these columns going up from all these desks, mm -hmm. right? And that was where your electrical and everything came in, right? Anyway, SMED had a much better more far more elegant solution and look beautiful mixed with offices and refreshment centers and everything else but if you had a raised floor cisco just came out with their phone system that was all plug and play as well as lucent so we would put in we'd spec the raised floor and by the way we were specking five million square feet at a go like it was massive right so if you could spec the raised floor you had a very good chance of getting a lot of that office work as well because you could deliver it all. And, well, you know, literally, you got the foundation, yep. and what then you got to go with what came on top of exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> like, literally. So where I'm, going, where <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. going with this is we just got off a call with an architect who said, if we could do raised floor, if we could do like, you know, 10 inches or 12 inches, right, I could go in and we could we wouldn't have to just worry about doing a full conversion on a building. We could do part. And by the way, that is the biggest hole in this market. If you can convert part of an office building to residential, versus the entire building. There's actually far more work there than there is in just converting the buildings. Now, don't get me wrong, we'll do both. And we actually have an acquisitions team that is working with investors now to go acquire buildings to convert. So that's, that's a big part of our business. And that is going to be the core of our business, actually. That's probably going to be at least 50, if not more percent of our business is but what i'm also hearing from you is the creativity support. of right it isn't black or white there's a mixed use option like there's a few ways yeah. to skin this cat to really identify well yeah i might if my office is just upstairs maybe and i live or my downstairs and i live upstairs yeah. and my retail and my grocery stores then the same like that that live use blended of quality of life to get away from the big commutes and which, which most cities suffer from way worse than calgary just at the most superficial level the soul-sucking yeah. reality of those <laughs> <laughs> well and it's 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 a good use of building. Like mm. uh, what's changed with COVID is that uh, and building owners are just, they they're either believing it or they're not. Okay, they're either <laughs> they either think office is going to come back or they're realizing it is not and they're stuck with something that they don't know what to do with. So if you're if you're you know in in the kind of the latter camp, then yeah, okay, you'll wait it out. It, it, office is going to get better. I think you're just waiting for a falling night to just keep falling, right? Well, because back to the it, if I hold my breath long enough, it'll go back to it'll go back to the way it was. And it's not. And yeah. and there's mm -hmm. so many dynamics that changed with COVID. Um, you know, and the major ones for us are one, once you've had a taste of working from home, I don't have to worry about, you know, getting ready for my commute, right? I, you know, and I don't have the hassle of the commute. I can deal with my kids on a better schedule, right? I, it, 
there's just so many advantages, right? As both and, of us sit here in our home offices talking to each other. Well, exactly. And right? I looked outside, and it looks like the roads might be slippy, but I don't. It doesn't. I don't. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> and how, and but, but here's the other part. I, and I, I, you sort of have to remind people of this. And it's only been what three years, maybe you know, a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, three years ago, would you have gotten on calls like this? Would you have no. spent your day? You didn't even want to get on a Zoom. No, call, I avoided but, it like the plague. Wacky, I avoided it, Doug, right? like the plague. Yeah. Now. <laughs> That's all everybody wants to do. And, and, and it's really effective. I mean, I literally hold anywhere from like five to 10 meetings a day all around the country and sometimes all around 100%. the world. Right. And it, that is the new way of doing work. And, and there's more and more tools that, that allow people to do that, right. To better and better, like your cooperative work. So, you know, the writing's on the wall, it's done. The die is cast, get used to it. Right. So, um, it, it, so that's what we're we're I don't want to say we're capitalizing on, but there hmm. there's still a, I think there's still going to be this whole mindset that's going to take about another year or two to go through. And the other part that's going like if you look, there's literally two things that we help out here. One, there's a housing crisis. Mm-hmm. Right. We're helping solve that one. There's a crisis in office. Right. We actually help that now. Office is coming down in value, very much like housing did in 08. Right. Low 708. Mm-hmm. That's what office is going through right now. It's a mass correction in the office market and valuations, massive correction. So if I'm a business owner putting the business and you said about your investment arm and all of a sudden I need to look at the valuation on my building and all of a sudden all my formulas and all my equations that keep yeah. me on side are going offside by doing this. Does that immediately shift me into a different valuation perspective when I move this to residential? Like, is it also a way out of maybe getting out from under you're falling out of covenant and all of a sudden all your lending and all your structure and investment model is breaking because the valuation of your building is dropping off. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're the bank holding the property, which yes, that is the case, right? So you're probably not going to get your, your loan back, right? So you're going to have to write off a portion of it. Um, A fair amount of banks have started to sell off those, those buildings. Mm. Um, Now some are holding those simply because they don't want to be seen as the next Silicon Valley bank or, you know, uh, first Republic, but you know, because that's, that's what happened with first Republic. It was their office portfolio that brought them down. Which Um, used to be the trusted safe zone, right? (laughs) Yeah, it used to be (laughs) exactly. Right. Especially when you hold office buildings in New York or Chicago. Yeah. Right. But I mean, you talk to architects and you talk to commercial, um, realtors or real estate brokers in in those cities and they'll tell you b and c space some of it's like 80 percent vacant right like big big numbers so uh, you know and if you had purchased that building anywhere between 215 and today you probably paid a pretty penny for it yeah you're upside so down in a big way <laughs> there's buildings in new york and that are and well they're all over now but there's buildings throughout north america now that are that had Originally sold in like or or acquired for that two hundred million dollar number, which seems about a pretty steady number in that that space. Um, that those that building now, if it goes to market, is probably a fifty million dollar building. Ooh, that's right? a right. That's a write down that stings. Seventy five percent. Right. So yeah. they're somewhere in that. That, 50 that, to 75%, that puts it into perspective. Right. But if that happens now, the numbers work for a conversion. Right. Right. For, for the most part. Now, in Calgary, it was a bit different. Um, in Calgary, and, and by the way, a, a lot of these buildings that you're talking about, they, a lot of the buildings could be paid for. They're typically owned by a family or a family trust. They could be paid for. The reason the family trust doesn't want to spend money on that building one way or the other is simply they don't know what to do with it necessarily. They don't want to sell it even at, at a discount, even if they don't owe anything, because they get a big giant tax hit if they're not taking that money and reinvesting it. So we're there going, hey, if you'll put the building up as collateral, right, we can go and borrow the funds to convert it. I see. Right? And then we can share in, either they sell it for profit or share in the revenue. We're quite willing to work with you on a cost basis to get this rolling. What we offer, the reason that prefabricated is so attractive for a lot of these folks is they're just realizing we compress the risk cycle, yeah. right? Especially on the interior build, and we get heads and beds faster. If there's anything we do that's appealing, it's heads and beds faster. And we just tell folks, and we get a superior product out of it. But if you look at it, it's like you have to ask yourself, what is that worth? Because the reality is your income stream is starting six months to a year sooner 
than if you use conventional construction. That's a real big bonus, right? That's a big contributor to a good return on investment when you're looking at converting. And I would guess a lot of these family offices or trusts that you're talking about, they're not construction experts. They're not necessarily real estate experts. It was just part of the portfolio, which makes it even more challenging of what do we do with this thing, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And, and they rely typically on their broker for that information. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we're finding more and more brokers are reaching out to us. So, uh, you know, as, I mean, a big part of what we're doing, um, because my background is marketing and sales, we have a very big push. We have media buys in to trades. So we're actually working with uh, some media companies to get our word out there. We don't do PR. We do our own stories. We have our own in-house marketing group. Mm -hmm. uh, we're actually uh, doing our own event coming up called the Future of Housing. So we're doing a virtual event where we're going to get all folks from from the industry, from all sides, architects, everybody speaking towards the future of housing, what that looks like. How are we going to get out of this mess? So there's a there's initiatives. So I've got a more holistic view. I mean, I my my raison d'etre is I'm I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my natural life, right? <laughs> Till one 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 something breaks, right? <laughs> um, hopefully it's not the mind, yeah. right? But uh, you know. To like, this is it, residential housing. I got 20 years in doing it as a realtor. So I got a ton of experience there. So there's even things that we bring into our solutions that you don't even see conversions are happening now. They don't even have it. They're not even doing things like water detection, water arrest. Now, the one builder in, in Calgary that's the most, I would say, the smartest builder by far that's converting and also uh, understands prefabricated, that that person understands that. So they're putting in things like water detection and other things that should, should have always been basic. Like they should have been basic 20 years ago, but that goes back to that argument of how we built, right? The biggest problem with condos is water damage. That is the I, biggest I, problem. I immediately think yeah. of two or three friends yeah. that had either, they blew up an old water bed back in the nineties and flooded the four floors <laughs> below them. Or I think there was some yeah. alcohol involved in that story, but right away, I immediately, I immediately go, Oh, yeah. I, I know a story. I think we all do. Like, yeah. The water bed era. That was a weird, that was a weird yeah. time <laughs> yeah. for those of us yeah. that were around. That's why for that. they don't, but they don't, they remember yeah. they stopped allowing them in. Apartments, yes. Right? Because yeah. So, like, can I put a swimming yeah. pool in my bedroom? No, I actually think yeah. that's a bad idea. <laughs> Malt swimming pool. Yeah. <laughs> now I want to put a hot tub in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll put a hot tub on my patio. Maybe yeah. flood the neighbor out. Um, yeah. You talked about Calgary, obviously was very poised for this opportunity because we got back on our heels earlier and <laughs> we got our, yeah. our ass kind of proverbally handed to, to us, but obviously we're still a smaller market. Just like I can look and count the buildings versus talking about some yeah. of these other markets that you're in being in Calgary. Did that give you that opportunity to kind of basically pilot and test some of this, put the theory to test, get some gym use cases. And then as a business, you can't help but go to the bigger markets because they've just got more buildings. <laughs> well, we'd love to get involved with the use case here. And what's, okay. what's interesting is, um, so we've been in communications with all of the, the building owners, the developers that are converting. Um, we're still getting, honestly, we're still getting our ducks in a row. They're fairly okay. close. There's a couple of pieces. Well, back to we six months to in. So let's give you, let's, yeah, let's make yeah. sure we give you credit for well, that. Yeah, we're about, yeah, we're about a year, or typically a year in, because we were, we were obviously planning and putting things yeah. in place. What Calgary did for us was when we looked at it, 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 when we originally looked at it for prefabrication, it was like, there, there is a business case here. Why they're not doing it, it was always about the cost of doing it because it, it, it is more expensive to, to, fa to fabricate in a factory, but we're using better materials. We don't use drywall at all. It's all MDF, fire-rated MDF. So you're using better, that's your baseline, right? So, and it looks mm -hmm. better and it, it performs better. What it does though is, and this is what they're finding out in Calgary right now, is that the on-site labor for interiors is reduced by 70% or more. So you don't need near the, the labor. And that's the biggest problem right now anywhere, right? Other than, I mean, never mind the empty office problem. The other problem is getting anything built, right? You just don't have the skilled labor, the trades that you used to. Nobody, wow. And, you, you know, you, you've got all these university graduates that are having, you know, problems getting, you know, the jobs that they really want or train for, right? And then you've got this whole lack of skilled labor. And so we help solve a lot of those issues, right? So that that's a big part of it as well. It's just like, you know, you just look, you have to look at the whole thing holistically. But again, to answer your question, Calgary was more a, it was sort of like a Petri dish okay. for this, right? Going, 
Well, geez, if COVID came along, right, which nobody's planning for, if a major disaster came along that hollowed out office, boy, would there be a big opportunity. So the opportunity really wasn't born to do this, right? Like there was there was the, what you would call the template for it. But until COVID, it didn't make business sense to do it mm-hmm. as we're doing it. Fair enough, because it just, there wasn't that big of a push. Yeah, it wasn't that big of a market, right? That, that investment up front, is that still... How many times you run into that? Like I can, I can invest now, but I'm looking for shorter term, but real estate by its nature is a little bit of a longer term horizon. So does that, does it make that investment upfront narrative make a little bit more sense because it's maybe a longer term asset? It, typically, I would be careful what it, well, there's, there's no is or isn't. It's just, I'm, I'm, but I'm that's, slicing it. I think I was alluding to it earlier. If you own an office building and, and by the way, architects are leading this charge as well. If you own an office building, what they're saying now, especially with the, these towers that are going up, well, we'll, we'll just say 40 plus stories, right? Yeah. Um, maybe that building should be looked at very differently. Maybe it should be looked at as more a, a, a structure that can, should be flexible and accommodate uh, changes right as, we move, mm-hmm. as we move through time. Because the one thing you don't necessarily want to do is take down an office building that might be, you know, 40, 50, 60 years old, simply because the amount of, you know, encompassed energy and waste, uh, you know, that, 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 that represents, if you can save that building, what does that look like on the eco scale? Because if you build a brand new building, whether you build it out of concrete or mass timber, you're still having to take down that structure and deal with the waste. Right. And if you're building new concrete, again, the concrete's, you know, in terms of a green solution, it's not very green. It's no. getting there, but it's not. Um, so, and by the way, we view mass timber as as we move into the future as our build from scratch solution. Because oh, interesting. We, okay, our solution isn't just being considered for conversions. It's also be considered for new build because we can go into a new build and populate that just as quick. So we can reduce time cycles on new build as well. So it's not just, I mean, that's the opportunity here. It's just, it gets us into prefabrication for multifamily, right? That's, that's really the, the, what's going on here. I do appreciate the blended use perspective of like, it's not a foregone conclusion that if we build like building a building for one purpose, we are, the the cycles of the the world we live in seem to be compressing in terms of change, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you look at, um, I, I think it was, um, uh, N-O-K, a knock. They're an architectural firm. One of their architects came up with a design. Somebody's got a building that they built, and now it, it's basically only 20% occupied office building. They came up with a mixed-use scenario. So they put more kind of uh, common area in the middle. Yeah. So that's where your stores would be and maybe your, you know, some, some recreational facilities. And then on top was going to be a uh, like rental. Right. So long term and below it's going to be hospitality. And then right under that was office. This so, is, <laughs> and our solution is actually very flexible. So it can accommodate all of that. We're quickly living in sci fi. Don't you find sometimes, Doug? <laughs> you think about oh, the I movie. I want to live in sci fi. I've yeah. always thought about the future. That's where I've always wanted to live. <laughs> well, it's, the future is here. It's just not very evenly distributed. That's an old 80s quote, I think, and, from way back when. And not like I expected at all. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you. You're expecting what you're creating, which which I which, yeah. I, which I appreciate. Yep. So talking about build, talking about Calgary, how many of these kind of conversions are happening? Because I hear stories that they're they're in process or they're getting near tear lands or different people I know I in the construction. The, so yeah, the the program's oversubscribed. So I'll just talk to a little bit about the, what the program okay. is in Calgary. Uh, when Calgary came up with the program, um, basically they came up with a really clean, super easy to understand program. They drew a map around the the city core in the belt line it said any office building in there that wants to convert from being an office to residential any part of that building is converted to residential and gets an occupancy permit we will grant you 75 dollars a square foot so like a tenant basically like a ti yeah yeah, totally yeah so it's like you know what Hmm. i convert it i get a check for 75 bucks a square foot for what i converted that is for residential that is still and is i mean this this program's getting not just airplay in North America, it's getting looked at uh, from Europe as well. It's considered the gold standard, if you will, of conversions for municipalities. And the oh, number wow. is seven, cool. 17 buildings are on the docket to be converted. So um, it is by far and away the most successful program. I, I think if every city adopted a program like that, you would see, it, you know, it's going to put a, that would put a dent in 
in housing in the or, housing issue for yeah. certainly yeah for certainly for rental the rental market right and and certainly uh, revitalize the core of cities but you know that's the cities they're they're screaming that that's what they want to do they literally have the solution right in front of them uh, it, Will it, they? it's a bricks and mortar solution like literally, literally. You, can, you can drive down the street and see the potential and, right huh. so like everything is right in front of them just adopt it right yet you know, politics is politics, you know, and, you know, it's, and all politics, all politics is local. So, you know, unfortunately there's just this grind. Now, one thing that did change in the last month was uh, the federal government in the United States, the white house released um, a program. They started a program that released $45 billion in funding to HUD and HUD is going to give that to municipalities that are looking to convert buildings into residential. Okay. So we may see very similar programs in the U S so, but again, uh, in real estate, you know, everything and in real estate and startups, timing is everything. <laughs> so that's, we are an opportunistic play. No two okay. ways about it. We know that, but we also know this has a ton of runway. Housing is a major problem. Um, mm-hmm. Housing is going to be in distress till 2030. Right. Just based yeah. on the numbers. So uh, never mind the fact that, you know, we're, we're in it today. I mean, it, you know, it, housing is in North America so far behind. It's not funny. Yet you go to China and they have the opposite problem. Way overbuilt. They right? overbuilt, so, yeah. Yeah, but in North which is America, a much bigger conversation from a demographics perspective and kind of what went on there in that building boom, which well, was maybe and, a bit or- orchestrated to, as well. <laughs> well, exactly. And, yeah, and yeah. that was it was a big that's where a lot of people invested. Well, like their personal investments was yeah. was in real estate. That's not here. And North America is very different. Um, we rely more and more on technology to solve or come to the to you know save us, if you will, right, as a solution. And I call it the robots are coming. Right, that they are finally starting to take you know building homes in factories, building residential homes, you know, factory built. That's starting to get taken very seriously. And I don't see any other way uh, to fixing this problem. And by the way, SAIT and Nate are also very well aware of this, and they have programs specifically designed for folks to go through that whole program of not only getting a trade certificate, but also understanding how factory-built housing looks and works. Well, it's it's that, like... The robots are coming, but they're also going to be your coworker. Like there is who can work <laughs> alongside, right? And I've had a yeah. few conversations on the show. Like you're going to be in a, yeah. a commercial kitchen down the road. There will be a robot doing something in there. And it's yeah. very, very easily to kind of just look over and think yeah. you're going to look at a robot. But your ability to understand not only the craft that you're in, but the understanding that that automation and that robotics plays alongside you, yeah. that's the tradesperson of the future. <laughs> yeah. And they, they become more facilitator at that point. Right. So because, you know, they'll never get as accurate as a as a robot will. Right. I mean, what are the advantages? <laughs> There's things that technology get, does better than we do. for sure. Tired, <laughs> and it's very accurate. It's right? never hung over, Doug. <laughs> yeah, it's never hung over. What does it not do? It doesn't know if it's doing something wrong. And it doesn't a thousand know times perfectly. <laughs> well, yeah. Or, geez, did something go wrong with the paint? Did the paint go from yellow to orange? It doesn't know that typically. Right. It's even with AI, it's going to have issues. So. Probably even bring up more problems, right? But new, I, new know, exciting problems, yeah. Yeah, new. Never thought of that one problem. Um, so, anyway, long story short, though, it there's no question uh, whether it's design or architecture, or whatever. There's there's just so much technology coming to bear, and it's technology too that's going into the environment. So, what we build is we're working with Honeywell on part of our solution. So you'll literally be able to walk into our residence, and as if you're a renter, you'll just be able to take your phone and connect to your, uh, you know, your, uh, your accommodations and set things the way you want, set the lighting color, set the temperatures, set all of well, it. Well, it'll already know you your profile. It. It'll already know your profile. It'll know your profile. It'll <laughs> yeah. have music playing when you come home. You do what you want, right? Well, the I, the IOT the aspect of this is huge. <laughs> it's yeah, it's very huge. So we have to make sure that we accommodate and build for that from day one. Now, the other mm-hmm. thing that we do is, you know, a lot of what we're doing here is we will be on the technology side. So we're building a tech stack that includes digital twins and all the rest of it. So if anything goes wrong in the building, we can pinpoint it. We have to have building talk to residential. So we call it smart building, smart home. So we've got a lot of that type of tech going on. We're working with train. So with my background to get this started quickly was, look, I don't want to build a factory. I don't have to build a factory. My partners have factories, right? They've been in both commercial and residential. They understand both. What we do is we tie all that together. 
So back that's to your, back to your, the, so, the data center experience comes full circle. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. So we're an integrator at that point. We, yeah. we, we, we've become an integrator. So our IP, if you will, is learning how to take all that, integrate it, and then put it into the environments that we see, you know, what, what's in, coming in a way that'll us. directly benefit the environment you chose to apply it to. For sure. Yeah. And, and a lot of the tech. So we future proof what we can. Talk to me a little bit about just the, the business itself. Obviously I'm seeing funding and grants coming in from the technology side, the construction side, like you, you've got your, 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 you're in a few different camps when it comes to, does that make a, uh, is that a challenging conversation with like, wait a second, are you guys a technology company? Or are you a construction company? Are you this? Are you that? Like, yeah, how's, so how's that, that, how's that story been to roll out? <laughs> well, and it's funny because when you, when you're going out, because a lot of people can't put you anywhere. Yeah. So that's exactly what happens, right? It's funny because we just got approved by um, Autodesk. The, the folks that do AutoCAD, okay. uh, we just got approved by them to come into a, they, you have to get invited into this program. It is not, you know, you they don't just throw something. it out. They don't still go give no, keys to everybody. It ain't like, Hey, you know, you know, pay your entry fee and you're in, um, you have to be doing something that they consider to be, I, I wouldn't say revolutionary, but definitely, um, a different approach. And what they do is they will, they will bring resources to bear to help you solve these problems or help create solutions for them. So we were invited into that, but it's exactly that same thing and the reason they develop that is because they bridge a lot of that it's like they're a tech company everything is built basically in a computer and then goes to construction but they know there's that that in the middle part right and because are we a developer are we a construction company what are we so are we you know an integrator it, it, and, 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 it's and, and an, inve an investor uh, like i can i can pull the <laughs> yeah. list just by our chat so far so yeah the, i think <clears throat> the answer is I, if I was going to place us anybody, and that, yeah. by the way, there's a term for it. And by the way, Alberta and specifically Calgary is way ahead on this curve because you talk to people in the U S and they go, what is going on in Calgary? Like, Oh, I love know, that. I love there's that so much stuff pouring out of there, that city. And a lot of it, a, a lot of it does have to do with construction tech. And I don't mm -hmm. know what, how we became a hub for that, but we are. And that's where we play. I think that's where we can be identified as like we're, we're that company tech. that does bridge a lot of that and understands the future. And that that's really what we, we offer. And that's what we play at. So we're a construction tech company, but, and there's two markets that we have identified conversion as a service. So we go in and help others or we'll acquire, convert ourselves, build ourselves. Acquire and convert. So mm. that, yeah, we have a whole business plan that takes us out into the future here. So when you're talking to, and again, however, want like, has this been funded? Has this been uh, some some angel oh, family that's a very seed? Good, how, like, yeah. how how do we get to here? <laughs> here's a here's an opportunity for your <laughs> listeners. So, <laughs> and I'm going to set the ball up, Doug, and you can knock it right out of the park. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, the the reality is we're self funded today. Okay. So okay. we've so there's three primaries that have that are involved in the self funding. So there's myself, Spencer, and my son Dexter. So that we that's that's who's invested in this company today. We're going through what's called a safe round. So mm -hmm. call it angel, call it whatever, friends and family. It's called a safe round. So really, what that is that's the that's the funding that's to get us to building the tech stack and everything else. What's happening in tandem with that is we're actually out working with capital partners to go acquire buildings to convert. That is separate. But this company, our primary company, why it's called Industries Inc. is because it is going to be involved in every single acquisition as the the builder, the developer of choice. So we'll have our own architects. Mm, okay, Everything get gets specced on our side of things. Our partners are involved. And the reason that's really critical is we're we're doing that on a cost plus basis. So really what we're doing it for is to either we're going to sell that asset once we convert it and populate it right then it becomes attractive for a reit or someone because now it's yeah. it's gone residential and if they specialize well, in that, it puts it back or, into a way that they can understand and relate to it a lot right. easier right? or yeah. or it might be an office reit looking to convert it right so but anyway that whole program is designed so that the company the the mothership and i and i say look look at us as a like a like a studio like a film studio right is that the film studio is the one that initiates the projects, right? And distributes and does all of that sort of thing. So look at us as that. When we get involved, so the actual films, if you ever look at how film's made, it's always made as a, a limited liability con construct, a partnership. Yep. And the reason for that is if anything goes wrong, 
with that film, it doesn't take down the mothership. But what you're really after is that you want the film to do well. So when the profits come in, everybody shares the investors in that building, but also the company, the studio that put it all together. That's how we've built this. Okay. That so makes sense. we'll get involved in a lot of projects, right? As a partner versus, uh, hey, you know, we have to figure out what our profit's going to be. Here's our end price. Then they go, well, can you cut this out? Can you cut that out? <laughs> it doesn't, it, then you're not even getting the right, right solution. So we have to say no, right? So almost everything we're doing, and because of, uh, of where the market is right now, a lot of these companies are either in trouble or their assets are definitely in trouble. And they're like, can you help us with this? And we go, if you want a partner, we're your partner. We're your ideal partner. That's it, that. yeah. And that's where we think not only will our company survive, but our investors also will survive long term. Because, that, like I said, the amount of housing that's needed, New York, 500,000 apartments by 2023. That's, that's the requirement. Toronto, 300,000. Right. The United States is short five million. Canada is short about two. So like just if you just talk about apartments, rental apartments, that's what you're looking at. Interesting to hear you that number. Canada two and the US five. We're in wayward yeah. shape based on usually they always you can just times it by ten, but that was not what just happened. Like just even that deficit, that shows how dire it is here in my mind. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It does. It, and it's it is a crisis here. Like, and you can't, well, and, you, and you can't well, talk to anybody. You're like it, it is, it's, it's not yeah. under the rug either. Everybody knows. <laughs> yeah. It's 5 million homes by 2023 for Canada, 5 million, right? We're coming into 2024, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I know those, those, those are all, we've already missed that boat. No, we've already yeah. missed that boat. So, yeah. So the, like the opportunity is, is, is big. And that's why you see a lot of money coming into factory built housing, right? We just, we had to pick an inflection point that worked well for where we're located and and, and our backgrounds. I was going to say so, your, your background lends to it. Go right. go go where you go where you understand, and then do something different there. Right? Well, here's the other thing: I put a team together. So my co-founder is actually the total opposite of me. A young guy, Cornell graduate, two engineering degrees, right? One in computer science. He's been through four startups. So I said, look, if I ever start a company, I met him through a men's group in Los Angeles, actually, um, well, online, of course, because it was COVID, right? So, um, but anyway, uh, Spencer, uh, you know, we've been talking about this for well over a year. And I just said, look, if I start a company, would you be interested? And he said, yeah, absolutely. He got his toes wet, right? So he didn't quit his day job, if you will. Yep. Um, but he did quit his side, day job. I think side hustle is the right term. <laughs> yeah. So he did quit his day job. Um uh, just recently and just he came in full that's time. awesome so that's a big so step. as soon as we yeah. as soon as we incorporated th that was it and then we've got uh so one of our our board of directors chuck kraus he was in-house legal for dirt for three years so we've so got a connection directly with our key partner so uh, we have a really strong board one of our and then one of our um other key uh folks that we brought in uh, is a gentleman that does a lot of development work uh for the big players in california so he's gotten big projects approved in the state of California, in Los Angeles County, in San Francisco. So he's got a long track record of getting projects approved and working with governments. No, knows, so how to, handles, knows how to navigate the waters. <laughs> and he handles all our government relations. So like, so we set up our company as best as we possibly could for success in this arena. Um, maybe silly question, but maybe not. Is the biggest risk here just the sheer size and the the, the, the velocity of the, the need and this opportunity? Like I know, which is a double-edged sword, but it's real. It's still a sword. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I, I, I hope not. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I hope we plan. You never, you never get everything, but, he, but here's what's the nice part of this because all of our partners are in office, right? So they're in commercial. That business came off quite a bit. There's a lot of extra capacity right in the factories and in in the field for accommodating any new work if you will so all of our partners look at this going like this is a great opportunity for us so specifically even around uh, our main partner dirt because office came off so drastically right it's slowly building back up but it's not going to go back to where it was yeah. what can help fill that void well i mean when you look at the numbers you know and how quickly the that you know 20 years of, of prefabricating office interiors, you get to know how to make things. Yeah. And by the way, uh, that, that partner just brought in somebody from Mercedes 
that had helped Mercedes design and build their factories and their, you know, their, their basic quality control. So you're, you're, the, 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 the A team is coming together is what I'm also hearing. The, not only is the A team there, but it, it has a lot of spare capacity, hmm. a lot. There's even a factory that was built just before COVID that's just sitting there ready for new capacity. Um, so the, there's a, uh, the, so to answer your question, we don't see it as an issue, but it comes up all the time. But yeah. when people realize just how much capacity is there, then they're, they're, that goes away. Because right. if, you know, if you've got 40 buildings to convert, actually the architect we were just on with said, I have a client that has over 100 buildings they're looking to convert, right? That would be like, well, how the heck are we going to manage this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> for them, it's like, I got to get contractors in all these different cities. And like, who's going to manage all this, right? Well, if you have a standard for your interior build out, boy, a lot of problems just got solved really quick. Well, right. you move, you move, so, you, move you, you move construction yeah. from organized chaos yeah. to no, it's a product and it has a, it has guardrails and it has those things built yeah. in, right? Yeah. So oh, very, again, it's very all exciting. about timing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. T- totally. And then working your ass off <laughs> just to yeah. be blunt. <laughs> you got those 16 hour days. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Elon totally. Musk, Elon yeah. Musk, whether you love him or hate him. I mean, uh, the guy's inspirational. Right? He has a work ethic. <laughs> yes, he does. Yeah. And yeah. if you weren't brought on through that work, I was reading the breakdown of like why the, the conflict is like, well, these were people that he inherited that didn't have the work ethic. He created some of his other organizations. And as an owner, I'm like, yeah. well, I can kind of, really, I get that a little bit. I like, I, I appreciate that as much as sometimes it looks like a dumpster yeah. fire from the outside. <laughs> Yeah, uh, makes I, for makes for good headlines. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, uh, Doug. What's uh, obviously and, and all, all joking aside, you guys are in the middle of your yep. safe round right now. Uh, yep. Someone want go to your website, give you a call. Got to hey, classic. Yeah, what's an, the best way to get a hold of you, Doug? The best way is go to arthrotoe.com. Okay, that is go there. There's an investor portal and there's a questions portal. Contact us. Like all of that is there, um, and it's easy to get a. And if you if you just want to get connected with me, just go to LinkedIn. Nice. And just look for Douglas Hayden and you'll see um, there's probably 30 of us out there, but um, you know, there's only one that's, there, there will Calgary. only be one. There will only be one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> with a, you know, working with a company called Arthrito. So um, anyway, that that's the easiest way to get a hold of the future of housing c- is factory built is your headline, right? At the stands. There you go. Then, it. you know, you found the right. Yeah, guy. I did. I did. <laughs> I knew, I knew, I knew. I knew. Doug, thanks yeah. for coming on. That was uh, that conversation went by super fast. Very curious yeah. to learn more about this space. I'd love what you guys are doing. Thanks for just your transparency around it. And, uh, and, uh, I yeah. love that you guys are based here, but yet the world is your opportunity. That's powerful for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, if you want to, you know, you know, reconnect in a year and see yes. how we're doing game on love to 100%. Do that. yeah. that's my favorite okay. part of this community is like well, we'll circle back like the where are we now kind of kind of <laughs> yeah uh, or whatever kind of happened to we don't yeah, want yeah. that one <laughs> no no i one think it's gonna wonder. it's gonna be a where are we now but dog it was a real yeah. pleasure having you on thanks for the chat and uh good luck with everything and we we will talk again <laughs> okay much appreciated Tyler.